Okay, hello and uh, welcome to uh, In the Same Boat, British and American Visual Culture During the Second World War. Um, I'm Dr. Eric Stryker, visiting from SMU and one of the co-chairs of the conference. Um, and I want to just uh, give you an introduction to some of the uh, themes and concepts that we hope to become part of the discussion over the next uh, couple days. The people of Europe do not ask us to do their fighting. They ask us for the implements of war, planes, guns, tanks, which enable them to fight for their liberty and our security. We have furnished the British with great material support, and we will furnish far more in the future. In the future. Roosevelt. You can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> Churchill. Two voices, two quotations, each with a different valence. Roosevelt's stern rally of American popular support. Churchill's comically underhanded praise for his ally. Each became part of a historical memory of the Second World War by different means. Roosevelt's speech was distributed as a newsreel, securing itself, in a, in, in, securing itself a place in the memory of historical archives. Churchill's quote is most certainly apocryphal. Uh, there's no known record of his having spoken these words or similar. He didn't say it, but perhaps he should have. <laughs> Instead, they are part of an oral tradition in the cultural memory and legacy of the war. But whose cultural memory of the war exactly do we mean? Does it represent collective British frustration with the American seeming habit of entering wars well just a little bit late? Is it primarily a form of kind-hearted cross-cultural mockery spoken by Brits to the Yanks in social gatherings? Is it a saying rehearsed by American and British politicians or diplomats as a means of encouraging expedient policy decisions? Or does it represent an American willingness to joke about our own recidivist isolationism? while maintaining the myth of American exceptionalism, our basic moral rectitude, wisdom, and goodness, despite our messy democratic lethargy. In fact, at least in recent decades, this last possibility seems to be the most likely. The, the quote, always attributed to Churchill, has been used on Capitol Hill in countless public events and debates. During the 2013 debt ceiling crisis, for instance, no less than five congressmen and women deployed it, one of the most frenzied instances of, uh, to borrow Britishism, Churchillian drift. The gap between these two acts of authorship is a fitting way to introduce this conference. We are gathered to consider the relationship between visual production and the Second World War in two countries. As most of you are no doubt aware, we are convening during the 70th anniversary of VE Day. It is only fitting to take stock of our dual cultural memories of those years and benefit from seven decades of critical hindsight in so doing. However, we, might all, we must also contend with the problem of deciphering layers of authorship and audience. Consider Words for Battle, a Humphrey Jennings film produced for the Ministry of Information's Crown Film Unit in 1941. The film rose from the recent British documentary film movement. It contains rousing voiceovers by Laurence Olivier, resetting passages from British literary greats, Milton, Blake, Browning, Kipling, coupled with vast pastoral and aerial views of that green and pleasant land. This material composes the near entirety of the film, with two critical exceptions, an uncomplimentary view of Hitler, ranting incomprehensibly, and the film's climax, which is reserved for Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Lincoln's words are joined with his image, uh, a long take of his likeness in Parliament Square in London. So then, at the pinnacle of a sequence of invigoratingly patriotic sound images of a proud Britain, one rooted in its landscape and deep, deep literary identity, is poised Lincoln, that great emancipator, stepping off his chair as if to advise, or perhaps even lend a hand. An image of American interventionism, to be sure. It is beyond doubt that this film was aimed at a British audience. However, the Crown Film Unit produced films that were intended both for a domestic audience and audiences abroad. To, to a popular American audience, the inclusion of Lincoln's words might have been heard as an appeal to American national pride a sense of moral duty to intervene, the memory of a just war, perhaps, 
uh, and no doubt a sense of two nations with shared values. Indeed, stateside, the film's majestic landscapes and its gentle people may have even worked as something akin to a military recruitment technique, albeit one which borrowed from tourist advertising. However, one can't help but to wonder what valence this sequence might have had to someone sitting in a cinema in a British city, where every day the skies loom with technology, where the Axis threat to national sovereignty is much more of a present threat in everyday popular life and popular culture. Certainly, Lincoln would have been understood as an icon of hope in which America figures as not only ally, ally but savior. But at the same time, the self-sufficiency of the United Kingdom and its geopolitical might was by then inescapably in question. The American presence in the UK was a double-edged sword, foreshadowing the decline of post-war Britain and its empire, and the ascendance of the US into global superpower, a power that would, in instances like the Suez Canal crisis in 1956, tell Britain what it can and cannot do. In short, even, when, even where visual works are truly transatlantic in their content or distribution, we might wish to resist completely merging our two national lenses. Let's keep in mind, even when allied political and military efforts were strategically aligned, differences emerged. Famously, the competition, some have said rancor, between Montgomery and Patton, for example. Similarly, we might wish to say that American and British visual material from the years 1939 to 45 was produced neither in perfect collaboration nor perfect isolation, but rather in something of a vast ocean of negotiation, collaboration, and difference. So then, as we go about our collective task of considering a great variety of images and visual objects produced in these years, we are also asking fundamental questions about the ontology of images in military, militarily mobilized societies. Such works are often, though not always, made with the dual imperatives of topicality and mass communication. We must address how do images speak about the war. Here, the Ministry of Information seeking to recruit the empire behind it relies on physiognomic typologies sent, set into a racial hierarchy, for example. Also, who is do the speak, doing the speaking? Is it the photographer, artist, graphic designer, the publication, the commissioning body? Uh, and here, the, again, the Ministry of Information speaking to the British public through an invented Nazi alternate persona. To whom are they speaking? American audience, British audience, or both? but also possibly an Axis power in the case of allied propaganda, misinformation campaigns, and psychological warfare campaigns such as drops of allied periodicals, including American comic books over Germany and elsewhere. We must also ask ourselves how well are visual messages heard across a notion of difference between dialects across different media and within divergent visual practices. For instance, when we turn to art objects, specifically painting and sculpture, we are presented with possible failures of the ideological lens, which cannot quite rein in, perhaps we might say, modernist abstraction. Abstraction's promise of universality should make it universally legible, and yet a refusal of representation might diminish topical relevance or even subvert official messages. So is abstraction a reluctance to participate in the war effort, or is it diagrammatic and therefore proximate to the functional visuality of military strategy and planning, like aerial photography or topographical maps, or here uh, a, um, uh, a report on the dam buster raids uh, from 1943. We also hope to locate not only clear points of collaborative or distinct visual cultures, but, also, but to question the significance of ambiguity and ambivalence in such images. Indeed, that familiar phrase, the fog of war, is an apt metaphor for the visual landscape we are navigating, where the ideological lens of propaganda seeks clear messages, clear meanings, and is planned strategically 
before being, if you will, deployed to armies of photographers, filmmakers, artists, exhibition venues. Um, the view on the ground is quite different. The movement of friends and foes becomes illegible. And here, Paul, Nash, Paul Nash's Battle of Britain uh, as an example of uh, this sort of work. The strategist's bird's eye view loses its practical value. Here, Motherwell's view from a high tower uh, uses, uh, amongst other things, uh, military maps as part of a collage. Trickery sends false messages. Uh, here from the Operation Bodyguard uh, campaigns, uh, sort of feels of false planes meant to deceive, uh, where the, the view from the air is quite different. Uh, it's a false view uh, from the view on the ground, the sort of true view. The subject's position of the image maker intervenes. Uh, here, uh, Lee Miller is a good example of this. Uh, her personal narrative is quite interesting, uh, as well as the sort of um, localization of surrealist tropes into the real. The encounter with the other disrupts. Uh, here on the left uh, from Time Magazine, The Three Good Hates, uh, an example of um, artists, uh, one Japanese, one German, one Italian, uh, being uh, invited to caricature uh, the uh, Axis leaders, uh, but also artists who were later um, classified as enemy aliens, uh, Arini, uh, in that in that story there. Or on the right, uh, the sort of humanistic, uh, potentially humanistic photograph uh, of a, a young German soldier uh, outside the Battle of the Bulge. Blackouts obscure visible identities. Uh, and here, I'm using slightly cheating, these from 1946, but nonetheless, an example of a Bill Brandt photo, photograph in which uh, both fog, ambiguity, darkness, we could say kind of chiaroscuro and silhouette figures uh, seem to belie uh, the sort of signification of direct identities. So perhaps the visual, more than language, is especially open to misinterpretation, vagary, duplicity, ambivalence, fog. And this is the unifying character of the visual culture of the Anglophone allies. To borrow terms from Roland Barthes' rhetoric of the image, war imagery seems to so often want and find anchors and relays. But the nature of war produces environments where visibility and legibility are stretched to a breaking point. And it's just interesting in examples like these, this from uh, the, the, the um, convoys to Malta, uh, that there's so much uh, of an anchor. Uh, in text to signify the meaning uh, of, a, of an image, to, to, to signify what the, the content is. This brings us to the conference's primary questions. First, can we locate and define an origin of what would later come to be called the special relationship between Britain and America in the visuality of the war? Do natural allies produce naturally similar visual culture? during a crisis, and if there are marked differences between them, what brings those differences about? <coughs> Secondly, can we formulate a model of un for understanding how the visual cultures of war relate to, reflect on, wrestle with, represent, or resonate with the actualities of war in this age of total war? Here, we must address the real. Is the representation of real events, real conditions, real needs, an inescapable political dictum for image producers, and who gets to, determine, gets to determine the reality represented. Third, how, indeed how much, do we distinguish visual media from each other in the degree to which they can be mobilized for the war effort? Does the very fact of mobilizing artists in all media towards the war effort extinguish the relevance of medium specificity? And finally, how can we account for the role of institutions, governmental organs, artistic communities, institutional networks, periodical publications, in not only shaping wartime visual production according to the needs of the war effort, but also in providing alternative discursive spaces of expression? A ration of food for thought as we venture forward. Um, at, at this juncture, I will hand over to Tatiana, uh, one of the co-chairs for the conference, uh, who will speak to you about the conference's backstory and logistics. So, 
Welcome. Thank you, Eric, so much. Um, so the idea for this conference uh, was motivated by the desire to revisit the early 1940s and to give texture to the period and individual work, artworks created at the time, uh, primarily by initiating conversations across geographic and methodological divides within the World War II scholarship. Although World War II uh, has long been a neglected subject in the historiography of both American and British art, with a few notable uh, exceptions, including the scholarship by our two keynotes um, for the conference, there has recently been a resurgence of interest in this period. This past February, a CA panel entitled New Genealogies of American Modernism at Mid-Century, which was chaired by Angela Miller and Jody Patterson, provided a much needed forum for reconsidering of the reflexive divide between pre and post World War II culture in the United States. Similarly, the upcoming panel entitled On the Visual Front, Revising World War II and American Art, chaired by John Ott and Melissa Wren, that will take place during the 2016 CEA conference. It will certainly provide another important intervention into the study of the period in the context of American visual culture. On the other side of the Atlantic, we have experienced a wave of interest in 20th century British art history following on the foothills of the Victorianist fascination with modernity. Nevertheless, here too, art historical research into the 1940s has been slower to pick up the pace. Yet ch things are changing. After Peter Stansky's World War II and the Blitz, which was published quite some time ago, we now have Brian Foss's War Pain, Art, War, State, and Identity in Britain, 1939 to 1945. Monica Baum-Duchin's recently published Art and the Second World War provides a compelling overview of the visual production during World War II across the border, including artistic responses to the war in Britain and in the United States. This conference then aims to provide a forum for a variety of scholarly approaches to the early 1940s that together acknowledge the heterogeneity and complexity of the period in question. By focusing specifically on the American and British context, we also hope to shift the access of the scholarship on transatlantic and transcultural exchanges during the war from a more established New York-Paris access to incorporate alternative wartime geographies and modes of artistic interchange. So over the next two days, we'll have five panels total. Three panels are scheduled for today, and then two for tomorrow, Saturday. There will be two keynote addresses, one on Friday evening at 4.15 p.m., and another on Saturday afternoon at 11.15 a.m., um, as well as the screening of the Canterbury Tale on Saturday, which will be followed by a roundtable discussion. We also hope that you will be able to join us for a reception tonight um, that will start at 5.30 p.m. Um, and it will take place in the null drawing studio, which is in the basement of the Loria Center, so this building um, here in the basement level. We are immensely grateful to all the institutions, organizations, and individuals um, who helped to make this event a reality. This conference is made possible through support from the DARE Foundation for American Art. Um, it is also generously sponsored by the Yale University Department of the History of Art, the Yale Center for British Art, the Edward J. and Dorothy Clark Camp for Memorial Fund, and the Whitney and Betty McMillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Eric and I um, would both like to particularly thank our co-chair, Sophie Linford, um, for her immense contribution to the conference. Uh, many of you might have been in touch with her already in preparation for the event, um, and you can attest to her incredible attention to detail, astute mind, as well as her thoughtful and good-humored nature. We are immeasurably grateful for all her hard work and valuable insight. Um, this conference would not be possible without the help, consistent support, um, guidance, and encouragement from Tim Berenger, uh, Paul Mellon Professor of the History of Art at Yale University. Professor Berenger's own work and broad range in expertise in the period served as an important source of information and inspiration while developing the concept for this conference. 
We would also like to thank Director of the Yale Center for British Art, Amy Myers, and Dr. Martina Droth, the Head of Research, as well as their fantastic team for all the advice and assistance on the conference. The British Art Center is currently closed for renovations, uh, but it will reopen in um, spring 2016 with an exhibition of mid 20th century British artworks recently gifted to the museum by Rhoda uh, Pritzker. We owe a debt of gratitude to Nat Cook, uh, Charles F. Montgomery um, Professor, for supporting the conference from the very, very uh, beginning. And we are grateful to Nicole Chardier, the business manager of Art History Department, for all her hard work on the logistical details for the conference. A big thanks um, to Victoria Pierre, who has been invaluable in assisting with different um, stages of organizing and coordinating the, the, this event. We're also grateful to um, Jennifer Robb, assistant professor in Art History, for helping with chairing the afternoon panels. Um, as well as to Katie Trumpner, Professor of Comparative Literature and English, and uh, Kirsty Dudson, Doctoral Candidate in Art History and Film Studies, for leading the discussion after the film screening uh, on Saturday. Thank you to all the presenters for sharing their work and ideas with us over the next two days, and thank you all for coming, and welcome.